Well, Happy New Year, beloveds. What a sweet uh, time to be able to sort of set aside our first day together, our first Sunday, our first day of the new year. It happened to be the same day. And um, I'm sure there's another first of our first Sunday Night Thrive. And here I am again saying it's wonderful to have you. I'm glad you pulled up a chair and, and, uh, and came to join us. And I know God's got really cool stuff planned for tonight as we continue through the book of Leviticus. You know, there's some people that actually think this book is boring. What are they thinking, right? So let's pray and let's get, we'll get into our chapter tonight, Leviticus 9. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of this time. I pray you would bless it, that you would minister. God, immerse me in your Holy Spirit so that every thought, every intention, I'll be you. And in that, God, now have your perfect way as we seek this time to be your time. Be blessed with it, Lord, in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, doesn't that just make you want to sing a song? Well, it does for me. came to save and to deliver and ransom souls out from the grave and now you seek to find such a man so here I am standing the gap but here I am
That's my prayer. Use me now, please, to minister as we sit at your feet, as we seek to be edified, blessed, and equipped for the work you've ordained. Have your way now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab your Bibles. Well, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, what another wonderful evening it is to be in the Word, as if there was ever an evening not to be in the Word. Nonetheless, having my tea for the evening. This is a lovely black apricot God has blessed me with uh, from a Camden tea house in Camden, London, Camden Town. Oh, sorry for the loud sip, but it was very nice. I will say that. All right. So we are now digging into the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the book of Leviticus. Boy, how was that for a good start? <clears throat> I want to remind you, uh, God has sort of laid out the five basic sacrifices in the first five chapters. Uh, and then uh, he... You, is he's laying out this issue of us approaching God by the sacrifice of another, then of course there demands a priesthood, somebody to be able to perform the sacrifice. And with that, then God is going to now really bring us into the narrative of that very much of that priesthood being inaugurated and its first act. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's expect God to do super awesome things. At least I'm expecting that. I think you are too. Father, thank you so much for your time now. Uh, to, in your empowerment and the ministry of your Holy Spirit upon us. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what it is you wish to say through this gorgeous book. In Jesus' name, amen. I would say tonight as I would any, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible be the final say. Or as I would say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. All right. Leviticus 9. Prior, we have our narrative really predominantly in Leviticus, our chapters 8 through 10. Uh, really, you see, see Moses preparing, and then the priests beginning, and then really God responding in some pretty serious ways. We'll see that in chapter 10, but even at the end of chapter 9 here. And in chapter 8, uh, prior to this, Moses has done the work. He has washed he has clothed, he has anointed his brother Aaron, Achron, and his nephews. Uh, that's, by, by the way, we'll find that there are four of them. Uh, and that'll become much more prominent next week. Uh, and then he's anointed with this very well-scented, beautiful uh, uh, anointing oil. That recipe was exclusive to this purpose. And he anoints the tabernacle and all of the furniture in the tabernacle, all of the utensils in that, which means that the priests smell like God's home. And I like that idea. So here they are. And it's again, you can't wash yourself, clothe yourself, anoint yourself. That's got to be God's doing. And God is using Moses to do that at this moment. And then Moses demonstrates these sacrifices, uh, which then his brother is going to take that baton t today. So Moses then, uh, he kills the bull for the sin offering. He kills the ram, the first one for the burn offering. And then he kills ram two for the consecration. And then takes the blood of that animal and puts it on the right lobe. And then the right thumb and then the right big toe of his brother and his nephews. And then there's the bread and the thigh. They wave in praise to God. And blood and oil is on their clothes. Then they have this feast. The rest is thrown in the fire. And eight times in one manner or another in the previous chapter, we read, as the Lord has commanded. And then we left off with uh, Aaron, Achron, and his sons, his four sons, then, if you will, shacked up in a spiritual quarantine in the tabernacle. And that is where we left off. And we'll see then 
on the eighth day after that, we begin the next chapter. And so I want to start there for a moment, and then we'll dive into our, our text. And that is that somewhere before they are going to begin to practice the rules and rites and rituals of the priest, there is this essential, critical time spent just alone with God in God's house, planted in the house of the Lord. And in that, they will be able to then operate from the overflow of that time for the ministry God has called them to. And I think about how many times Jesus would say, like in Mark 6, 31, when he would tell his disciples, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. And there was this idea. And even when Jesus calls the 12 by name, the disciples, we read that he called them to himself. First and foremost, before they were to be sent out to do anything, he calls them to himself. So now we are going to see that transition from Moses demonstrating these things to actually them doing these things. So the chapter rolls out like this, verses 1 to 7, Moses is going to give the orders with this promise that the Lord will appear and that the glory of the Lord will appear. Then in 8 to 14, Aaron's going to have to, Aaron's going to, have to sacrifice for himself because he's a sinful human being, even as a high priest. And then in 15 to 21, Aaron is going to have to sacrifice for the people. And then after sacrificing for himself and for the nation, then he'll turn and bless the people in verses 22 and 23. And then finally, God's response to that in verse 24. It is the only time, pregnant, but oh, lovely pause for a very good sip of tea is the only time where succinctly the priestly procedure is distinctly chronicled in narrative is right here in this chapter. There's all these commands of, how, of what to do and such, but here we actually see them do it. And God really kind of draws this out for us to see. And therefore, this chapter is one of the most studied chapters at the Yeshiva Utz, uh, Yeshiva Im, in, in Jerusalem, as well as other religious schools, and also in those groups that seek to, uh, like they're seeking to try to build the next temple, by the way, the Temple Institute, for instance. But what God is showcasing in this is not simple, if you will, sort of practice protocol and procedure. God is highlighting, he's showcasing the obedience that they've done to his command, even to minute detail. God, and that's our simple takeaway, is that no obedience to God to its most distinct, small, seemingly insignificant detail is ever missed by God. And God is really pointing that out even here. So if it appears to be very detailed, it's because God is saying, I'm, I'm noticing that they're doing it the way that I've asked them to, or that, I'm sorry, that I've commanded them to. Six times in this chapter, that will be iterated in some manner as God commanded, as God commanded Moses, as Moses commanded, or according to the prescribed manner, for instance. So let's take a look at our first five verses. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And the children of Israel, uh, to Israel, you shall speak saying, take a kid of the goats as a sin offering and as a, as a calf uh, and a lamb, uh, both of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering and also a bull and a ram as peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord and a grain offering mixed with oil for today the Lord will appear to you. And then in verse five, so he brought what Moses, so they, that's the people, brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. In our first five verses, and what I want to just sort of do is sort of develop some takeaways. It says in verse one that it came to pass on the eighth day. Now, the eighth day, not only of their seven days quarantine, but that's a specific day of the week. And if we start, we know that the week starts on a Sunday. We know that, in, we always know that because the last day of the week is the Shabbat. Or as we might say, Sabbath. And this tea is so good, I'm going to have to pour some more. With that said, 
If we do eight days then from that, that puts us at a Sunday. I just thought you might find that interesting. So on this particular Sunday, after seven days of quarantining with God, if you will, or spending time alone with God, Moses calls Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he says, okay, here's the shopping list, if you will, the young bull, the ram, that's going to be for Aaron's need for sacrifice, and then the kid of the goats, a calf and a lamb, and a ram and a, a bull and a ram, and that's going to be for the people's sacrifices, and he gives this promise with it in verse 4, for the Lord today will appear. And the word appear is the word means to be seen. So God is going to be seen today. And so we read in verse 5 that they brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting. But it ended in verse 5 with this, that all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And the word before is the word panach or panim. It means the face. It is the word that is translated presence, like the presence of God. The presence of God is not a mist or a feeling or an experience. It is in the simplest sense, the face of God. And I say that because if when I'm looking at seeking God's presence, what I'm really looking for is God's face. And that really blossoms for me in my pursuit of God because I realize what I'm, what I'm seeking. If I were to seek your face and if I had your face, do you know what I would have? I would have your attention. Not that I'd want to put your face on mine, but that I'd have your face facing mine. I would have your attention. And when I'm seeking the presence of God, what I'm not seeking is just some power, some esoteric experience for which that somehow validates my being because I was validated at the cross. It's all I need for that. But rather what I'm seeking is God's attention. And if I knew that when I'm calling upon the presence of God and I realize that what I'm really seeking is God's attention, I think I might behave a little bit differently than just simply try to make it something that's if in essence sort of a spiritual Red Bull, if you will. So first, we have these sacrifices, first for himself. And the takeaway here is, take for yourself. I must first deal with me spiritually in the areas of sin, that's the sin sacrifice, and the burnt, which is the issue of surrender, before I seek to be a leader in those areas for other people. I have to deal with my sinfulness and my surrender and I never want to over I never want to subterfuge or ignore or neglect those aspects of my own life because the way that I'm going to view you and the other people that I serve hinges on my clarity and my acknowledgement that I myself am a sinner that has been saved by the grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus and my need to surrender because even after my sin has been paid for and I've accepted the gift of Jesus, and if you haven't, I will give you that opportunity tonight. But there is still a will dwelling inside of me, as Paul would write, 22 years after being saved, why do I do what I don't want to do? That which I know to do, that would be right. I, I, don't want, I don't do that. I don't find myself doing that. But that which I know is wrong, I find myself doing that. That's Romans 7. And they'll say, oh, wretched man that I am. And, and of course, that's for another development. The point for this is that before Achron is going to, to perform these rules or rights on others, he needs to make sure he gets it right for himself. I need to seek to keep my heart for the congregation with those aspects next. Once I've dealt with the sin in my own life, and I deal with the surrender that is necessary in response to God's forgiveness. Now I look at the congregation and I want to lead them in getting their sin dealt with and, and then challenging them in surrender, recognizing how hard that is because I myself am dealing with that. But then, because the third sacrifice they will make will be one of peace, I want to be able to celebrate their peace with God and their peace with each other. And therefore, and then the issue of grain, so I have a sense of solidarity in our setting our hands to God's work. This is the challenge. He's like, these are the things I want because Aaron, bro, big brother, 
you're going to need to deal with your sin and surrender first. Then let's deal with the sin and surrender of the, of the fellowship, of the nation, of the congregation, and then celebrate their peace together and then have that sense of solidarity and what we set our hands to, that be the grain sacrifice. And the reason for this is because today the Lord is going to appear. So stand in the presence of God. And that's where they are. And so put yourself in this position here. Here I am standing in God's presence, but awaiting him to appear in a manner that I can be seen. And I'm standing there with the proper sacrifices. So the people are there. God is present. They're before his face. They just can't see it. And I wonder how many times I would go to church or even in a meeting like this and that I wouldn't even acknowledge the fact that God himself is here among us. Verse 6. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, Go to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people. Offer the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Now, in our next couple verses, we see then Aaron doing what he's supposed to be doing. And again, he's now sacrificing for himself. That's kind of the idea, or at least the challenge to do so. We're going to see that uh, Aaron actually doing it in the narrative starting in verse the next part in verse 8 through 14. So Moses says, this is the thing which the Lord commanded you, so you should do it. But as where he told them first that the Lord will appear, now he tells us that the very glory of the Lord will appear to them. And don't miss that the last time they saw anything like that was God's presence manifest when the tabernacle was constructed as God had commanded them. They obeyed to do it the way God said, and God said, all right, well, I'm going to honor that by God by shining forth my presence in a manner for which every one of you can grasp. And so he says, do these things because the Lord commanded it. Quick takeaways, God does desire to show his glory. But it's my disobedience that can hamper that being seen. Now, whether that be that I don't see God manifest when he wants to manifest before me, or that I cloud up that ministry in a manner so that you wouldn't see God glorified through me. Neither one of those is to benefit in any way and they need to be dealt with. Moses doesn't command his brother to do anything he has not first demonstrated in the previous chapter. That's important to note. And God is going to do the same thing. When God calls me to do something, do I seek to see how he has exampled that thing before I actually go out there to do it myself. Because if I, if I don't do that, I'm going to be in a pretty dumb place, don't you, don't you think? I want to make sure that, that I'm doing it the way God demonstrated it. Otherwise, Christian culture is going to define it, and that will always be to the detriment of the way that I would do it. All right, our next section. Let's see how Aaron does it. And therefore went Aaron, Aaron therefore went to the altar, and he killed the calf. Don't stop there for a minute. This is now the time where his hands have gotten bloody. I remind you, in the previous chapter, when all the sacrifices are made, Moses did them. Now it's time for his brother, too, because now he's beginning the ministry. Achon therefore went to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And then the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured the blood at the base of the of the altar. But the fat, the kidneys, and the fatty lobe from the liver and the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord had commanded Moses. And the flesh and the hide he burned with fire outside the camp. And of course, having gone through the previous chapters, this all makes perfect sense to us. This is the way God prescribed it. And he killed, notice he killed the burnt offering. And Achron's son presented to him the blood which he sprinkled all around the altar. Then he presented the burnt offering to him with the pieces and head, and he burned them on the altar they presented. And he washed the entrails and the legs. I should do this. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. So now here we have uh, our section where now Aaron has taken that sacrifice for himself. Simple takeaways. The issue of who's killing now. 
Now, that sounds so crude and barbaric, but I don't want us to miss the whole point of it. And that is, we transition from somebody else claiming that blood to Aaron. I must personally see the blood shed for me personally. I, don't, I can't just speak about Jesus' sacrifice and not make claim to it myself. It would be like speaking about, well, this is a very lame example, but it, from a worldly perspective, people would get it. It would be like speaking about the, having the winning lottery ticket, but never cashing it in for what it's worth. And I wouldn't want to be one of those, like Paul would say, to actually speak about these things and then find myself disqualified in the very end. You know, to be able to, to see so many people do this and then have Jesus go, have we met? So now, Aaron transitions. He's watched his brother do it in the previous chapter, and now it's his turn. And as he's doing it, he's going to have to see the blood on his own hands. He's going to have to see that blood. And we know it's on his own hands because he takes that blood and he dips his, own, his finger in it. And then he puts it on the horns of the altar, the place where the sin sacrifice is made so that man can meet God. The place where sin is sacrificed, so the sacrifice for our sin is made so that man can meet God. Now, where is that for us? As we look back 2,200 years ago, well, 2,000 years ago, we must recognize the blood that was shed on the cross, where all of our sin was sacrificed for, where man could be reconciled to God. I need to see that blood that is shed there on my own hands, that it's, that should be my blood shed and not Jesus's, so that I can lead other people there with the conviction and confidence that his blood would cover their sins just as it has mine. And it was put there by my own hand. But then after he does that sacrifice, the sacrifice of sin, then he does the burnt sacrifice. And I remind you, we go from sin to total surrender. So here is Aaron now taking responsibility, totally surrendered to God, nothing kept back. And I want us to recognize when God laid that standard out, that when uh, the high priest was to sacrifice for himself, he could not sacrifice any of it, uh, any part of it, and then take it back to himself for his own benefit. If it was dedicated to God as a priest, as somebody that was ministering, it was to be left in God's hands, which really kind of blows out of the water than the whole Mark 7, 11 text, where the religious leaders could have given things to bless and to honor their family, their, their parents, for instance, but they were calling it Kodaban. And Kodaban means dedicated to God. So you would dedicate a bed or a couch to God, but it was in your house so you could sleep on it. And God's like, that breaks the commandment of honoring your mother and father. And you do this because you allowed this loophole through your own traditions and cultural caveats. And, and Jesus is saying, I'm not buying it for a second. But then others now write with God I want to see others celebrate their reconciliation with God. And for that to happen, now that I am right with God, having dealt with my sin, having dealt with my surrender to God, now I can turn and start making those sacrifices for others. And that takes us to verse 15. Then he brought the people's offering. And he took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and he killed it and offered it for sin like the first one. And he brought the, the burnt offering and offered it according to the prescribed manner. Then he brought the grain offering, took a handful of it and burned it on the altar beside the burnt sacrifices in the, of the morning. And he killed the bull and the ram as sacrifices of peace offerings, which were for the people and Achron's son presented to him the blood which he sprinkled all around the altar and the fat of the bull and of the ram and the fatty tail which covers the entrails and the kidneys and the fatty lobe attached to the liver. <clears throat> and he put the fat on the breasts and he burned the fat on the altar, but the breasts and the right thigh are in way, oh, I'm sorry, but the breasts and the right thigh Achron waved as a wave offering before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, 
We started again, verses 1 to 7, Moses says, this is what's to happen. Let's collect these animals, because Aaron, you have to sacrifice for yourself, and then you want to sacrifice for the people. So, uh, verses 8 to 14, Achron has now made the sacrifices for himself, and now he's turned to sacrifice for the people, verses 15 to 21. Some quick takeaways. First of all, the first sacrifice is always going to be that of sin because that's where it has to go. Until that gets dealt with, everything else will always be fundamentally secondary, fundamentally. And I never want to take for granted that. So I'm a couple comes in and they're in crisis. We used to, on the Central Coast, churches from all around the area would send us their troubled couples. I think they were sort of like, we don't want them. You can deal with them. And I'm like, please, I'll take them. And they were couples that had been to several churches with their, with their relational issues. And yet, the first thing we would do is get them to the gospel. What are you doing with your sin? Have you accepted the gift of Jesus Christ? Have you taken that which separates you, your iniquity, separating you from God, as Isaiah 59 says? And have you allowed the price God, the restitution God made for it, the paying for that on the cross of his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, dying on the cross, just like scripture promised, buried and rose again, just like scripture promised. Have you accepted that gift? And it was astounding to me how many couples would say, we have never had anyone ever share this information with us, especially in marriage counseling. And I would think, I don't want two sinners to reconcile to themselves first. I want two sinners to reconcile to their God because selfless love is impossible without the God that exemplifies and demonstrates who is that selfless love, that totally selfless love. So my takeaway that is he starts the ministry for the people, the first thing he's going to do is deal with the sin just the same way that's the first thing he's done for himself first, is deal with the sin. And then the burnt offering, I remind you, that of sacrifice. The sin must always be dealt with, and then the burnt must always follow. That sacrifice of surrender must be the inevitable product of us dealing with our sin. Dealing with our sin always leads to surrender, as Jesus would say to the woman caught in adultery, After saying, neither do I condemn you, he says, go and sin no more. Am I, as a priest called by God, not because of the caller, but because of the calling God has put on Scripture for the believer to be a priest, a holy priesthood before God, am I, as a priest, presenting forgiveness without forsaking? Am I saying, Oh, let God forgive you, but not challenging them to go and sin no more? If so, then I am not doing the priesthood the way that God is prescribed here in the book of Leviticus. First, it's the sin and then the surrender in my own life. But if I don't deal in my own life, it'll be really hard for me to see that in someone else. Uh, At least to preach it with conviction or worse yet, I'll see it and it'll remind me of my disobedience and I'll come at it harder because you know our sin always looks worse on someone else. Well, then it's the issue of peace, the bull and the ram for the peace offering. Do I press peace with others? Because I get the clear ordinance and commission from 2 Corinthians 5, 9 when it says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses and has committed to us the word and ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors now of reconciliation. Now for peace, do I encourage others with it? And when I do, do I, com- do I then celebrate it when it's, a- when it's achieved? If you can't have peace with God, you're definitely not gonna have peace with other people, not the way that God has ordained. Because the people he's gonna call us to are people we would not want peace with. Well. Then we move from the sin sacrifice to the burnt sacrifice to the peace to that of the grain. And that is the work of our hands. And I'd say, can I rejoice when God blesses other people? As again, to the Corinthian letters, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, as he speaks about us being parts of the body, differing in our ministries and functions. He says, when one part or one member of the body suffers, all the members suffer with it. 
And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. When one part is blessed and God is exalted or in in whatever way fortified, I want to rejoice because somehow that's going to bless the body at large, whether I am individually and personally a recipient of that or not. The beauty is, is that my heart for the the body is so functionally uh, desirous to see it thrive that something being blessed is only to their to the benefit of the body. I think that's a great thing. Whether or not I'm going to dip into that, that Annie is another story. So then I think, what is the product of being right and helping others to be right? Well, that's what we see in our last few verses, at least in Aaron's response in verses 22. So I want to remind you, Moses commanded... Bring these things so Aaron can do his ministry and the boys can do their ministry. And then from that, we see Aaron sacrificing for himself and then Aaron sacrificing for the people. Interesting. The, we'll never be the high priest. That's Jesus. That's clear and evident. We see that in the book of, of Hebrews, for instance. And yet, we get to be those under priests. And what did the under priests do? They administered the blood. That's what we've seen so far. Isn't that beautiful? Well, with that, Verse 22, take a look at it with me. And it says then, And Achron lifted his hand toward the people and blessed them, and came down from offering the sin sacrifice and burnt offering uh, and peace offerings. In our verse, what we find is, is that when we're doing it the way that God has called us, we find ourselves blessing the people. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I, I want to bless the people. And of course, the idea here, of course, seems to be some form of verbal doxology, if you will. And, and there are even those tradition says that he's actually going to do the chronic blessing. But God isn't even going to bring that up until numbers. So if it's so, it's prophetic. What I do know is that when God does what God does because we obe- and we obey the way we should, we find ourselves blessing. We'll see the same thing with Solomon after dedicating the temple and God being so profoundly clear there. He turns and blesses the people as well. I love that. And I want to do that. I want a heart to bless the people. I want a heart to bless you. And I want to start by doing this, obeying the Lord, dealing with my sin, handing God my surrender, and in that having a heart to see you do the same celebrating your peace with God and your peace with one another and with me and setting our hands to God's work and as we do, trusting God to bring forth then the fruit of it. All right, our last couple of verses. Let's see what God does. Verse 23, And Moses and Aharon went out of the tabernacle of meeting, which tells me Moses was there, and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Interesting. The glory then appears after Moses and Achron have been have blessed the people after their experience with God and their obedience. Their obedience to God has melded their heart in a manner to bless the people in the ultimate response. Verse 24. And fire came out. Notice from before, that's that same word again, panah, panim, the word for face, from before the Lord. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord. It doesn't say fire came out from the sky. Now it could have. But I wonder, I wonder if, if God is in their midst and they're seeking God and they're in the presence of God, they have God's attention, but they can't see that. First, notice the word and in verse 24. First, God appears. His glory appears. What does that look like? Does that look like a cloud? Does that look like fire? Does that look like bright light? Arguably, it could be that any of those, all of them, or something else. And yet, in that, fire came out from the presence of the Lord, from the very before the Lord. Now, that could be if God were amidst them. That could have come horizontally even, or it could have been a cloud above them. I mean, the only reason I say that is, is we can't be dogmatic on something that the Bible hasn't made clear. All we know is that the fire did not come from anywhere, but from the presence of God himself. And this is why, and that's going to be flavoring, uh, if you will, salting the meat that's going to be way cooked, super cooked next week. But here it is. Fire came out from before the Lord, consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. That is what God does. And I love this, that God shows, that appears to me that a fire hasn't, whether a fire has been lit yet, which it doesn't appear to be the case at the altar. What we do see 
is that God has put the fire on that altar now. And as the fire is on that altar, sent by the presence of God himself, the burnt offering, which by the way, God calls a sweet savor because it is one that is traditionally offered by our own volition instead of out of requirement. Although here it seems to be the protocol for this. And so you're like, I'm offering and God goes, because you're offering it, because you just want to. God's like, that is the sweetest smell to me. And any of you who love someone, be that your spouse or your children, you know how this is. The sweetest thing that someone could do for you is what they're not asked to do, but rather out of the abundance of the love of their heart, they are intentional about doing something that they know will bless you. That is so much better than just simply manipulating or hinting or whatever and kind of going, I could really use this. And then there are times, of course, that's necessary. But you know the sweetest smell, the greatest incense in the house is when people are just intentional out of their own volition and love of their heart. So God goes, Kablam! and then the, 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 the sacrifice is completely consumed. And of course, this will ultimately set the scene for when Elijah goes and has his showdown with the prophets of Baal and Asherah, because that's how God's going to need to respond there to show again his acceptance out of obedience, his blessing, the obedience. Now, the response so far is that Moses and Achron have uh, Moshe and Achron have blessed the people. God's glory has been manifest, and then the fire consumed the altar. And the only thing left is how did the people respond? And notice what it says in verse twenty-four. And when the people saw it, uh, they first of all they shouted, and the word is Achanan. Achanan means to erupt in a roar. And that is the easiest thing to think of is a stadium where a goal has been made. And I use that first because of the, the recent World Cup, but also because so few of those are done. Or the touchdown happens, a few more of those, but still. Or whether that's the game-winning three-pointer at the arc, and, and where the stadium, where the arena erupts. And that's the idea here. God has consumed it and people erupt. And then we read that they fell on their faces. So the results... First of all, the blessing. I want fellowship to know, you to know that you're blessed. And I want to be a part of offering that blessing to you in whatever way I can. Then the glory appears and manifests. And then the fire from God's presence that they were standing before. I remind you, there's God's presence. God's then, here I am, right there in the midst of them. And then consumes the sweet savor of that burnt offering. The people shout they erupt in that roar. That, by the way, the verb tense for what it's with is cal sequential imperfect, which means the people roar and continue to do so. And then they fall. Nepal, they cast themselves down. They throw themselves down. Also cal sequential imperfect. The chapter ends with God's glory manifest, God's presence manifest, fire consuming the sacrifice, and the people shouting and face down in awe. Now, isn't that a great way to end the chapter? And don't you wish this would be the end of the story? It won't be. But what we have in the simplest sense is some beautiful kind of uh, revival, if you will. And what a beautiful thing to say. Oh, God, that's what my, heart desi my heart's desire is. For whatever the ministry you've called me in, whatever it is, I know it's going to have the the essence of priesthood that I will seek to represent you to men and to be an ambassador of the people to you. Uh, and in that, God, I pray that you would please, even tonight, let me be honest about my own sin and recognize that John in 1 John tells me I could say it's not sin. I could deny that I've ever done so, in which case I'm a liar or I've made you to be one. Neither of those function or I can, uh, in any healthy way. Or I can confess that sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me of that sin, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I deal with that sin, but then I also recognize my responsibility to surrender. Then I seek to do that with others. Bring them to the place where that sacrifice is made. And in that challenge, their surrender. That's the beauty of this, isn't it? And then rejoice in the peace that they have with God and with each other, challenging people to get along. Yudi and Sinsaik, Hey, get along, girls. You've been helpful before, as Paul would say. 
uh, and but then also to set our hands to the Lord's work and in that rejoices God does so so Moses said bring these things they brought the things Achron sacrificed for himself Achron then sacrificed for the people and then with that he turns to bless the people and as he turns to bless the people God's presence manifests the fire consumes the sacrifice and the people fall face down in awe and say oh woo, yes God that's how the chapter ends and of course that's what God's going to show us next week I want to warn you is is that not everybody in the camp is actually there for the right reason or at least in the right condition well as we go to prayer how can I not say have you dealt with your sin now I'm not asking you to spend your whole life in introspection and make sure you've had a detailed list of everything you've done wrong rather Confess yourself a sinner before the one who's paid for it. In, in the same way, see the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross, Christ's blood shed for your sins in payment for them so you can actually receive his payment on your behalf. And if you're willing to accept that gift tonight, God is willing tonight to wash you clean from all of that. But in that then, we offer him in our gratitude our surrender and say, God, now don't let me make the mess of my life like I, I've done to come to you in the first place, but rather now be the Lord of my life and lead me forward. Now, if you've accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, then my challenge for you is to first of all, make sure that those things are still at a constant standing order with God, and then to turn to seek to be used by God to minister those things to other people, to encourage them to come and get their sin handled and to, to to walk together in surrender with others who are seeking to do so. And in that, rejoice in the peace that they have with, with God and with others. Encourage that peace and set our hands to the Lord's work as he calls us to. And be a blessing to people. Seek to bless them and watch how God manifests in the midst of that. But it all starts with this. Are you going to obey what he's called you to do? Because this chapter, in the simplest sense, is Moses said, this is what God told me to do. I'm obeying him to tell you. And the people obeyed by bringing the things. And then Achon obeyed by offering the sacrifices for himself, as God had ordained. And then Achon obeyed by sacrificing for the people as God prescribed. And then with that, they blessed the people and the people fell on their faces. Now, if we're going to call him Lord, may we have that obedient heart tonight. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for the privilege of this night and what you've done in this time. And I pray now, God, that you would bless, bless, bless my friends. As we have set aside this time, Lord, I pray you would minister to us in it. By even tonight, giving us a heart of obedience to you to follow you as you would lead, recognizing you call us as well. And the greatest reward is your pleasure in our lives and the relationship we have with you. So for every believer, those who have accepted your gift, I pray tonight, God, that we would be people who are typified by our obedience to you, that we would have that regular reality check with you in regards to our sin and surrender and then be used to administer that to others as well. But if there be any who have not accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, that cross, the place of sacrifice where the blood of Christ was shed to pay for your sins, Tonight, if that's you, would you just pray this prayer with me right now? Accept the gift of Jesus. And it comes with a simple prayer, something like this. Pray with me if you would. God in heaven, I confess to you I am a sinner. And that sin must be punished. But I believe you sent Jesus to pay that price for me. And he was, he was punished for my sins. 
crucified for my guilt. Just like the scriptures promised, buried and rose again, just like your Bible promised, and offers me absolution, forgiveness of all my sins. And I say yes. I say yes to have my sins washed away, forgiven at the cross of Jesus. And at the resurrection, I offer you my surrender to live the new life that you offer me there. With Jesus as my Lord, I hand you me now. I am yours in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer tonight, I would love to hear from you. I will leave a prayer. Uh, I'll leave an email address. You can get in contact with us. And we want to follow up. We'll give you materials, anything we can do to encourage you in this new walk with Christ. Well, shall we end with a song? Call me by my name Find me on my knees Find me offering My heart To you Follow me by my name Find me on my knees Find me offering My heart To you Here I am Jesus Here I am as your own and we praise you for being our Lord and our God now lead us forward from here we pray in Jesus name Amen God bless you beloved Happy New Year <laughs>